thank you for the opportunity to share with you today. In addition to my two daughters, someone else is here that I want to recognize. Dr. Zhao, would you stand please? Dr. Zhao is our oncologist and so grateful that he uh, is able to be here and uh, with us. Thank you. I was going to uh, <clears throat> approach today's opportunity to preach with the standard three points in a poem. Uh, however, as I thought more about it, I wanted, uh, about what I wanted to share with you, the fact that next month marks one year since the death of my wife, and the theme of gratitude and generosity this semester, I decided to share my story of grief and loss and to do it in a way that might most convey my experience to you. Gratefully, there is more to the story than just grief and loss. I have shared on a, a number of occasions how Psalm 23 has become very meaningful to me. The psalmist describes an almost ideal life of a shepherd guiding his flock to green pastures and quiet waters. If the psalm ended there, it would have been a sweet song with probably lasting, limited value. What about, uh, that basically has nothing to do with dealing with difficulties, but how wonderful everything is when everything's rosy and God is leading you. But the psalm doesn't end there. The psalmist continues. He describes the shepherd as a guide in the face of death and shadows of death, his rod and his staff. They're comforting because of the presence of the shepherd. The scene changes abruptly when the psalmist describes God as an attentive host who invites us to a banquet even as we confront life and death circumstances, feasting in the face of death, thankful for the good measure when experiencing loss, enjoying God's presence while losing the one who was most present to me. Gratitude in the midst of grief. That is my story. She was the love of my life and my best friend. Next month, on December 24th, it will be one year since the death of my wife. The grief and loss has been profound. Many of you know much of the story during the time of Linda's diagnosis and treatment as well as in the past year in the wake of her death because you have walked with me. You know much of the story, but today I want to share parts of the story that you do not know. The focus of the story will be on the time shortly before Linda's diagnosis and the current chapter. The final chapter, of course, is yet unwritten. <clears throat> Though it is difficult to know exactly when a chapter begins and when it ends, I will mark the beginning in December 2012. For at least many months before this time, I had realized my need for a private space. Our home is relatively small, and while we have a back den, the space was not just my own. I needed a place of solace for study, and especially for prayer, which I was wanting to more deeply explore. In December 2012, I decided to build my own place, a small, separate cabin, as it were. We had a little space on the side yard, and after planning for months, I began building in May 2013. I estimated that this would be a summer project. I could begin using it before school started again in the fall. Of course, there was no way to know in the beginning that in fact it would take 10 months for me to finish that cabin. In June 2013 my wife began to have symptoms and in July she was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. As we began treatment I continued to work on the cabin when I could. Building the cabin was therapeutic for me in many ways. It became a symbol of creating space in my life for both God 
and for cancer. It was a metaphor of what was being built at the same time that other things were being torn down. Finally, working on the cabin gave me time to physically exert myself and to think about something else which, which helped me to deal with the stress of the circumstances. I have spoken often in many places, including here at this pulpit, of how Linda and I experience deep gratitude for the tremendous blessings of God's presence and the loving support of friends and medical staff during that difficult time. As we faced the initial treatments and treatment failures during the first year of her illness, I continued, when I could, to build the cabin. The cabin was finally finished in March of 2014. I was grateful to complete it finally and to have a place to be alone with my thoughts and with God. However, because of the frequent travel for treatment and Linda's multiple hospitalizations that year, the cabin was not used as frequently as I had hoped. It became clear to me in the days and weeks after the early morning of December 24, 2014, that the cabin was built to provide the place where I would spend the time needed to work through Linda's death. It was in the cabin that I spent time in anguish, feeling tremendous loss and struggling with questions without answers and with the disorientation of grief. Here I cried and prayed and reached out for God and for Linda. In the cabin, religious books and icons continually reminded me of God's presence though the pain was so deep that no amount of faith could alleviate it. But of course, that is not the function of faith. Faith isn't about avoidance or alleviation, it's about embracing. Faith is feeling anguish and wanting the cup removed but drinking from it because, well, it is what it is. And believing that that God can somehow make a cup of sour wine and bitter dregs quench the deepest thirst. God's love was not always experienced though during those first three or four months, nor did I always feel his presence. There was simply too much hurt in the way. At times, however, an amazing sense of peace and calm would come over me. I was grateful for those times when my hurt would be soothed as if a warm blanket was draped over me. An interesting picture of peace is the one by James Dawson. I'm assuming you're looking at that now, right? Make sure we're coordinating. At the first, the observer is aware of only a raging storm. Where is the peace in that? However, while a number of hidden images are in the painting, the painting de depicts a place of safety and protection from the storm. Maybe you notice the bird in the cleft of the rock. I think if you click one more time, I'll, that'll get a little bigger. While it certainly can provide an interesting image of peace, it does not, in fact, accurately reflect my experience. I was in no way protected from the ravages of the storm. This painting by Rembrandt more closely describes my experience. I'm in the storm. I'm tossed by the waves, beaten by the wind and rain, frightened by the thunder and lightning. The painting depicts each disciple individually responding to the danger of the storm and to their fear. Like the disciples, I would hang on in different ways at different times. Sometimes I would just keep busy and I'd work hard to adjust the set of the sail, to stay on course, and, and, and to keep somehow from capsizing. Sometimes I could do nothing but hold on 
look upwards and, and, and wait for help, for some kind of intervention for, from God. Sometimes I just got sick of it all. But I thank God for the boat. And I'm grateful for those who are in the boat with me in some form or another. Friends, and of course, my two daughters, Lauren and Lindsay, who in spite of their own grief, minister to me, sometimes directly, but mostly by simply being who they are, good and loving persons. And I was grateful for the presence of the Master, who reminded me often that everything will be okay, though I could not always hear that message clearly. It has been rough sailing, but I haven't drowned in the sea. And after each crushing wave of grief, there would come, sometimes after a little while, but sometimes immediately, a wave of calm, as if God spoke to both my body and my soul and said, Peace, be still. That was all very much my experience during the first three or four months. But it's not the whole story. Months five and six seemed to begin a different chapter. I was still in the rocking boat, but somehow at the same time I was in the storm, the sun would break through the clouds and warm my face. I remember a specific instance of this. On this particular day, I was on the patio reading and praying, as had become my habit. It was good to be outside, and, and the weather was cool. I was reading Presence and Encounter, a new book by David Benner, and thinking of Linda. Initially, I was filled with great sadness. But suddenly, I began to feel something more. The experience became a mixture of, of pain and joy as I began worshiping God in a way I had not done in a long time. I praised him, I thanked him with a genuine openness and sincerity. The words just came to me and I simply spoke them back to God. I addressed my prayer of praise one at a time to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It was as if I was caught up in the love of the three persons of God that they have for each other. The tears were a mixture. The emotions were both sorrow and joy, pain and peace, loss and gratitude. I remember thinking of the incredible range of emotions I was experiencing all at the same time as if my, my heart expanded to be able to contain it all. My training and experience in psychology in counseling people who were grieving, helped me know something of what to expect in the grieving process. I knew what needed to be done. However, such knowledge and experience did little to help me do what I needed to do. For me, only the presence of God and the gift of grace have enabled me to integrate the grief of death into a larger life. Somehow pain can become transformed and transformative. While she was under treatment, Linda and I came to appreciate a saying we found written on a wall plaque in a store. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It is about learning to dance in the rain. Months eight to nine seem to begin another chapter, one that perhaps is being written still. I got out of the boat. Uh, no, I wasn't walking on water. No, rather the boat, the boat docked on an unknown shore. And I was able to leave it 
and walk on firmer ground. I began to enjoy fond memories of Linda. What a blessing to think of her and to smile, to recall a memory and to feel joy and to be grateful for that memory. The tears are much less now. The land to which I've arrived, it's uh, still a, a foreign land. But I'm learning to live better with chronic pain. Each day is more balanced with less extreme drops into grief and with more easily accessible experiences of peace and love and grace. In fact, gratitude alone feels a lot like peace, love, and grace. I suppose because gratitude goes so well with those other gifts. Each time a chapter ends, or at least I think it is ending, it is as if I am staring at a half-written page that divides the close of one chapter and the beginning of the next. I expect to go on to the next chapter, but the white wordless half of the page makes me linger a bit to reflect on what has occurred and to wonder about turning the page. It's sad, as time continues to pass, that another chapter has ended, and yet I wonder how the story will continue. The page will be, will be turned one way or another, I might as well keep writing and reading and turning pages. And at the very end of the book of my life, when the final page is turned and the cover is closed, I'll enter with gratitude an eternal place that perhaps includes a large library and a reading room where God, the author of our lives, along with the other one I loved dearly and who was and is such a large part of my story, will together tell me the story behind the story. A story of goodness and mercy all the days of my life. Amen.